Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Welcome to this edition of Michael Brown Unplugged. Glad to have you with me. I want to start with a story that I talked about Friday on the radio, and I don't want to, it's going to be different than what you heard on Friday because I simply asked a question on Friday. I presented the topic of this whistleblower, and I put whistleblower in air quotes because whistleblower connotates someone who comes forward at great risk to themselves to expose illegal, unethical, immoral, some sort of corrupt activity within the government. And generally, it's about a superior that someone, you know, the boss that you're working for or a coworker or someone is doing something inside the government or inside a company. A company has, companies have ombudsmen and whistleblowers can go to the ombudsman to report illegal activities. But in the government, we, we tend to call these people whistleblowers. And, and the presumption is when a whistleblower comes forward, the whistleblower has knowledge of some illegal activity or unethical activity that requires that there be an investigation and that the whistleblower gets – and in fact, under federal statutes, the whistleblower is entitled to certain civil service protections to encourage whistleblowers to come forward. In other words, if, if they come forward and they have an allegation – you can't then fire that person for having brought to the attention of an inspector general or a lawyer or somebody else, you know, a superior. You cannot then fire them for having brought forward this illegal activity that's taking place. I use the term whistleblower only because, and I want to emphasize only, only because that's the name or the term used in the narrative. And I quite frankly don't have any other term for it other than maybe a leaker or uh, a disgruntled employee or somebody that's just PO'd about something. This whistleblower ostensibly has, putatively has, information about some sort of illegal or unethical uh, activity by President Donald Trump. It appears that for the first time over the weekend, President Trump confirmed that he had discussed former Vice President Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden, on a July call with Ukraine's president. Now, this has caused, uh, I I truly don't know why, and I'll, I'll explain why in just a minute, but this has caused a lot of senior Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi late Sunday afternoon, to revive talks about impeachment hearings. The only reason that I can find in, in the news reports that, that Nancy has, that Speaker Pelosi has said that she wants to, to maybe consider impeachment probes is because the president asked a foreign government to undertake a probe that in their terms was designed to damage his potential opponent, opponent in the 2020 election. Now, yes, Joe Biden is a potential opponent, just as Elizabeth Warren or Cory Booker, if he if he has survived by the time this podcast goes up, or uh, Andrew Yang, or I don't know Bernie Sanders or anybody else, they're all potential opponents in the 2020 election. That opponent has not been selected yet. But here's some of the background, at least for, that I've been able to gather from the news reports. When the president spoke to reporters on Sunday, he suggested that in a phone call with Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, back in July 25, he characterized, the president did, he characterized Mr. Biden's anti-corruption push in in Ukraine while he was vice president as it's self-corrupt. And the reason the president says that this anti-corruption, and this is, man, this is the Orwellian world that we now live in. President Trump says that Biden's anti-corruption push in Ukraine while he was vice president was itself corrupt because what Joe Biden was doing was trying to protect his son who had business interests in the country. Now, back on Friday, as I was talking about this on the radio, Mr. Trump had declined to say what the two leaders had discussed, saying that it doesn't matter. He said, the conversation I had was largely congratulatory, was largely corruption. All of the corruption taking place was largely the fact that we don't want our people like Vice President Biden and his son contributing to the corruption already in the Ukraine. So let's just stop right there for a second. Let's say that there is some sort of indication 
I, I don't want to make a judgment call about how strong that indication is yet. In fact, I'm going to play something for you in a minute. And I'm going to, you know, in, I guess in the, in the uh, vernacular of Fox News, I'm going to report and I'm going to let you decide. The president is saying that what the vice president and his son were doing under the guise of trying to clean up corruption in Ukraine was actually itself corruption. Now, Rudy Giuliani, I don't know why the president continues to use Rudy Giuliani, but Rudy Giuliani on CNN, talking with Chris Cuomo, said initially that they that he had not talked to any Ukrainian officials about this issue. But then when Chris Cuomo pushed him or kind of got down into details about whether or not he had talked to the U- Ukrainian officials about what Vice President Biden had done and whether or not he had asked them to look into potential corruption with his son, Hunter Biden, then Rudy Giuliani said yes. So he didn't do himself any favors, and he he certainly didn't do the president any favors by the way he tried to weasel language the the initial answer, as as opposed to just saying, well, you know, um, I have had conversations on behalf of the president with officials in Ukraine, And I'm not at liberty to talk about those. End of story. Now, they could have speculated all they want, but Giuliani actually gave them the ammo to then start going to the president about, did you talk to the Ukrainian president about Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden? Now, let's just say for a second that when Joe Biden was vice president and he was traveling to Kiev, and he was delivering um, foreign aid, or he was delivering, you know, he was making making just a, you know, a, a junket of some sort. Let's just pretend for a moment that he did go over and he did ask, back in 2006, Ukrainian Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin, in his investigation of corruption involving uh Burisma, I think is the name of it, Burisma Holdings. It's a natural gas company. They identified Hunter Biden as the recipient of more than 300 million, I'm sorry, 300 million, $3 million from the company. Now, not wanting this corruption exposed, Joe Biden swung into action. He actually used U.S. loan guarantees as hostage while demanding that this prosecutor, Shokin, be fired. Now, what's fascinating to me is the vice president actually bragged about this matter. When I talked about this on Friday, I was like, I know I've heard somewhere that the vice president bragged about going over and withholding this money uh, until he could get this individual fired, this particular prosecutor fired. Well, sure enough, he did. In a statement or in a roundtable discussion of some sort before the Council on Foreign Relations, the vice president Biden said this. Uh, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <clears throat> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're, we're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. Oh, they put in someone who was solid. Now you can take that to you can interpret the, interpret that any way you want to, but in political terms, when you say, "Hey, you know, I really want to get rid of this person because I don't like this person or I think they're bad or whatever." And instead, I'm going to withhold a billion dollars in foreign aid until you fire this guy. And oh, by the way, not only did they fire him, but they put in someone solid. That says to me they put someone in 
that is favorable to me. In other words, favorable to the vice president. Now, the Wall Street Journal reported last week that the president repeatedly pressured his Ukrainian counterpart during some of these phone calls to work with Rudy Giuliani on a Biden probe, according to people that are familiar with the matter. Those revelations came amid this escalating standoff between Democratic lawmakers and the Trump administration over this so-called whistleblower complaint about Mr. Trump's communication with a foreign leader that might involve this Ukraine call. Now, over the weekend, Joe Biden told reporters in Des Moines that he had never discussed with his son any overseas business dealings and actually called for Donald Trump to be investigated, saying, quote, he's using the abuse of power in every element of the presidency to try to do something to smear me. Why don't we find out? Why don't we find out if that's the case? Now, I understand that there is a separation of powers issue and there is an executive privilege. If you don't, I, I think I spent either on this podcast or on the radio program, I think it was a radio program, on either Thursday or Friday last week, going through executive privilege and what that means and why we have it and why we should have it. Suffice it to say, because I, I don't want to relitigate the, my arguments about executive privilege, but I actually believe that a president is entitled to executive privilege, just like there's a privilege between an attorney and, its cli- and, and their client and a doctor and patient. I just believe that these privileges exist for a reason, and executive privilege exists so that a president can get unfettered advice risk from his advisors about what he should or should not be doing. And in this case... The president was getting unfettered advice, uh, or apparently getting some sort of advice, where a whistleblower, or whoever this individual is, I I can't think of another word, a leaker, a complainer, or someone who wants to bitch and moan about something, I don't know what they are. But whoever this individual is, that that the media wants to portray as a whistleblower, they're refusing to forward that whistleblower complaint over to the appropriate congressional committee. So it's setting up a conflict between the executive and the legislative branch. I'm fine with that. If you listen to the news media, you think you might think that that is the end of civilization and it's the end of the republic. Do you know that there are clashes between the executive branch and the legislative branch almost on a, every single day, if not every single hour? There are clashes like this over something Congress wants the executive doesn't want to give or something that the executive wants to do that the Congress won't allow them to do it. It's the nature of our system. But what it's done is it's led now to these increased calls for impeachment, and it's led to a new narrative in the media that the president has done something illegal or has done something to try to use the power of his presidency to go after one of his opponents. If, let's just say, that Hunter Biden did receive $3 million from this natural gas company, and it was because he was the vice president's son, that he had no experience, he had he, he just got the $3 million as a, and I'm using air quotes again, as some kind of payoff to buy influence with the vice president. And let's say that if we take the vice president's statement at face value, that he held up a billion dollars in aid until they fired a special, or I shouldn't say special, until the Ukrainian government fired a prosecutor. And he brags about the fact, Biden does, that not only did they fire the prosecutor, but they put in they put in somebody that was a solid, someone that they, meaning Biden and Obama, approved of. Don't we want that investigated? Because if if this had been, let's say Mike Pence, let's say a Democrat wins the White House in 2020, and Mike Pence had gone to Ukraine, and Mike Pence had demanded that they fire a prosecutor, a state prosecutor, until, or that they were, that Mike Pence said he's not going to give a billion dollars in foreign aid until they fire the special prosecutor or this prosecutor and then threatens to get on a plane and come back home. 
And then somewhere down the line, Mike Pence goes to the Council on Foreign Relations and brags about, yeah, I was meeting me. I, I made my 23rd trip to Kiev and I'm over there and I want them to fire somebody and they hadn't done it. And so they want to have a press conference and I say, I'm not going to go out and you're not going to get this billion dollars. Oh, you don't, you think I don't have the authority of the president? We'll call him. Uh, and then lo and behold, they fired somebody. They fired this prosecutor and they put somebody in. It was favorable to us. If Mike Pence had said that, and there was a Democrat in the White House, you don't think they'd been be, be investigating that? I just think we've reached the stage where there is so much corruption. There's corruption among the Democrats. There may be corruption among the Republicans. But as this thing continues to boil, I just want you to remember one thing. Don't lose sight of the fact that but for Joe Biden being a candidate for the Democrat nomination, there's probably grounds to investigate why he bragged about getting a prosecutor fired that ostensibly was investigating this gas company that had paid his son $3 million. I think there's, I think there's some corruption. And I think Trump's trying to find out if there was. The fact that Biden happens to be a candidate for the nomination, right now doesn't mean anything. Now, if we were past, if we were past the nominating process and Biden was the candidate, I think Trump would have to be much more circumspect and maybe put this off until after. Or better yet, how about just going to his State Department or going to his kind of going to chuckle here, going to his FBI and saying, did you ever look into what was going on? What was Biden bragging about? So in all this kerfuffle over the whistleblower, you've now heard the soundbite. Joe Biden bragged about withholding a billion dollars until a prosecutor that was allegedly investigating this gas company that paid his son $3 million and bragged about it at the CFR I think that's worth I think that's worth investigating. I'll be right back. It's going to be a tough week for me on on radio and on this podcast because this week is the United Nations General Assembly and as part of the General Assembly they're having a uh, international conference on climate change. And of course Greta Thunberg, Thunberg, Dumberg, whatever her name is, is getting all these accolades and getting all this praise for all the work that she's doing. But lo and behold, just to show you kind of what you're in for, Jerry Nadler, who is the Democrat chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, the one that wants to impeach Donald Trump, was giving a speech in New York, and he's talking about climate change in light of the climate change conferences that are about to be held. Now, I don't know. I thought we had uh, 18 months, or maybe it was three years. I don't know, maybe maybe we have more time, maybe we have left. But here's the kind of dumbassery that you're going to hear all week, all week long. Think, well, the sea levels are rising. It'll cost us $100 billion to relocate. A few million people will drown in Bangladesh and India, but that's bad enough. But it's much, much worse. Much, much worse. I have a 13-month-old granddaughter. And when I look at her, I get terrified. Because I don't know if human life will survive 50 years. We may face, the climate scientists tell us, that we may face the sixth mass extinction in the history of the globe. If the oceans acidify, which they're beginning to do, they will destroy the entire food chain, and essentially all that will be left will be bacteria and maybe some plants. You know, once again, I just think about the absolute arrogance of people who think that maybe we are facing the the sixth mass, mass extinction. I don't know. But what can we do about it if we truly are? Do we really think that we as human beings are more powerful than Mother Nature, than all the things that take place in the solar system that we have no control over that affects life on this planet? That's what, that's what amazes me, is when you think about 
water vapor, or you think about the effects of the sun, or you think about the effects of the entire solar system on this one little tiny planet, and we think that we can somehow alter the course of nature. The other thing that drives me crazy about Climate Week, or whatever they're calling it, I, don't, I have no idea what we're going to call it, is how we've created this entire generation that has, as I explained on the podcast or the radio, eco-anxiety. Well, now they're parading all of these rugrats out in front of the TV cameras because if you, apparently some people are so stupid that if they are on the wrong side of the climate discussion, you're someone like me that believes the climate does change, but that it's really not something that we can have much effect or control over, why then you need to, you know, parade out the children and show how the children are scared to death. We are abusing an entire generation of children. Take a listen. Rosie Clemens Cove. I'm 11 years old. We are here because our parents trash the planet, and it's up to our generation to save it. But my future is in jeopardy. All of our futures are in jeopardy. Baby boomers, all these people call us Generation Z, the last letter of the alphabet, because we are going to be the last generation to survive. We have only 11 years to rectify decades of damage that we have inflicted on our planet, and only 18 months until some damages are irreversible. And I am only. I, I pause for just one moment. Do you think, uh, as I'm sitting here watching this clip play, do you think that girl reading that, using the word rectify, she's 11 years old, do you think an 11-year-old understands what the word rectify is? I'm just saying I think maybe she's reading from a prepared statement that somebody wrote for her. I mean, call me cynical or call me a realist. 16 years old. I am here to speak for the trees. I'd like to acknowledge my privilege and my background. I am here for the people who are suffering and dying because of our country's decision. And we are not here to talk about our sacrifices and our doom and gloom and non-existing. We are here to create. We do not have time to be polite. This is a revolution. We are creating this movement every day because every day of inaction drives Ooh, I think she's, um, speaking of anxiety, I think she, she, she might need some, uh, uh, some puppy downers or something. Holy cow. In the 116th Congress, 9,621 pieces of legislation were introduced. Only 203 had the words climate change in them, even though that 70% of adults, 90% of kids believe that climate change is real and happening. From Ooh, 90% of kids. Where do you think that, how do you think that happens, that 90% of kids believe that climate change is real? Now, I, I have to be discerning here because I believe that climate change is real, too. I'm just not scared that I'm going to die from it. Michigan to the North Dakota Access Pipeline to South Bronx. This is environmental racism, and we must acknowledge the issue. The climate crisis will disproportionately affect the marginalized, the impoverished, and the voiceless. We refuse to continue with business as usual because we know that is a death sentence. I want our policymakers to see the faces of the people they are condemning to death. Rebel or die. We refuse to be the last generation to thrive. We are going to give it to the generations to come. Oh gosh, I'm done. Yes. Passing it on. Thank you guys. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, I'm kind of done with you, too. Oh, we have a whole week of this. But in, I, Now let me be serious for a moment. I sincerely believe that this is child abuse. I think that leading kids to not think about climate science critically, but to think about it only in terms that if we don't do something right now, that they will be the last generation or as Jerry Nadler said, we will bring on the sixth mass extinction. Why don't we let 11-year-olds be 11-year-olds? Why don't we teach them, I don't know, some 
basic theories of science. Why don't we teach them some basic theories of this republic, how it was founded and how it operates? Why don't we teach them how to think think critically about issues? Why don't we start telling them that there is more than one side to a story? Why don't we teach them, oh, I don't know, debate? Why don't we teach them anything, logic? Why don't we teach them anything other than propaganda? Because that's all this is, pure, unadulterated propaganda. I'll be right back. Poor old Marianne Williamson was asked about nuclear energy by a by a individual at one of these town halls, and she summed up so many different things about what I believe about those on the progressive left, particularly a Marxist like Marianne Williamson. She's asked by this child this, uh, what I consider to be a fairly straightforward question. Um, so you say that in your environmental crisis plan that you want the United States to stop all use of nuclear energy. What do you identify as the problems with nuclear energy? And what do you say to those who think it simply gets a bad reputation? So would you, would you tell us, Ms. Williamson, you, you want to be president of the United States. You're opposed to nuclear energy. Would you tell us what the problems are with nuclear energy? And, um, what do you see as an alternative or a solution? I want you to listen to this answer because, at least for me, and I know she doesn't have a chance in hell of winning the nomination, but I really think it, it shows you the inside of the mind of those on the left, whom I've always said, think solely with their heart. They don't think logically. They don't think rationally. They think that if something makes you feel good, then it must be good public policy. And if something scares you, why, that must be bad public policy. Well, I know Germany had said at one point, we're just going no nuclear. But then when they said no nuclear, there was a problem because they had a hard time keeping up with the other standards that they agreed to. What is wrong with that? If something goes wrong with nuclear energy... I don't think people have really stopped to take in the horror. See, we need an integrated politics. We need to go beyond hard data. We need to go beyond just thinking about the facts. I want you to think about this with your heart. Something goes wrong there. What are we even talking about? How can we even consider it? And so so what? Maybe we'd all be a little warm or a little cool. I mean, Americans, we have to decide. That's the problem I have with nuclear. Oh, we have to decide. We might be a little cooler. We might be a little warmer. But we just have to imagine. Yeah, let's not deal in facts. I mean, we've had how many documentaries just over the past year about nuclear energy, about uh, about Chernobyl, about any other kinds of uh, uh, nuclear accidents. What? Why don't we talk about it rationally? Because... Well, then that might show that actually nuclear energy is a is a good thing to do. We've become much better at storing, recycling nuclear waste than we have in the past. I'd love to see this country go nuclear. I'd love it. But then I think logically, and I don't think, oh, what was what what she call it? Integrative politics. We need to we need more integrative politics. If anybody can tell me what the hell that means, I'll buy you a Diet Coke. Integrative politics, my butt. I'll be right back. And finally, I ran across this short clip, a little over three minutes, where One American News, which is owned by this family in San Diego, talks about how if you relied on the liberal establishment media for information over the past week, you probably missed these five stories. These are really good five stories that maybe, just maybe, the mainstream media should have covered. To tell you about the news this week. This week, while the mainstream media obsessed over President Trump visiting the state of California, here are the things that happened that really matter. First, the Women's March cut ties with co-chair Linda Sarsour in the wake of Sarsour's anti-Semitic comments and history of anti-Semitic activism. But they replaced Sarsour with a woman who is even worse. Zahra Balu, the new board member they hired, compared the U.S. military to ISIS and the Nazis. 
She boycotted the movie Wonder Woman because the lead actress served in the IDF. Belou has said in the past there is no difference between Americans running away to fight with ISIS or running away to serve in the IDF. But then, after this show and others exposed the truth about Zahra Belou, the Women's March fired her following the outcry over her anti-Semitic, anti-American military comments. But did the mainstream media report on this story? No, no, they did not. The mainstream media ignored it. But rest assured, your voices made a difference. According to the Guttmacher Institute, there were 846,000 abortions in the U.S. in the year 2017. That's 34,480 kindergarten classes worth of children. Enough kids for 78,000 soccer teams. 12 NFL stadiums at full capacity. Twice the number of Americans killed in World War II. The entire population of Iceland, the Bahamas, and Grenada combined aborted. But did the mainstream media report on this? Nope. The only coverage from the mainstream media was a few articles quoting pro-abortion activists who said the drop in the number of abortions wasn't due to pro-life activism, but just due to falling birth rates. Democratic Senator and presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren refuses to admit that her Medicare for All plan will raise middle class taxes. But make no mistake, her plan will raise your taxes. According to the Heartland Institute, between 40 and 60 million Americans will be paying more overall for health care under Warren's Medicare for All plan because their taxes will skyrocket to significantly more than the health care benefits they would receive under the plan. Specifically, Heartland estimates that a family making a combined income of $100,000 a year can expect to pay up to $20,000 more in taxes. But did the mainstream media report on this? Of course not. They won't fact check Elizabeth Warren at all. Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar compared migrant detention centers at our border to African slave camps during the slave trade. Yep. Omar said the overcrowding in our migrant detention centers was the same, basically, as the belly of a slave ship. But did the mainstream media condemn Omar for this insulting, grotesque, and utterly false comparison? Did they detail why the comparison is grotesquely false? Nope. The mainstream media didn't report on this at all. And the last one, of course, is the supposed victim of the the latest outlandish sex crime allegedly committed by Brett Kavanaugh has no recollection of it happening. But we covered that. And if you'd been listening to Michael Brown's show on 630 KHAL or on iHeartRadio from 2 to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, you would have heard about that Friday afternoon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. I'll talk to you tomorrow.